Welcome, Dr. Bonsi. Dr. Antella Hi. Bonsi is the founder and executive chairman of GIA Miami. Prior to his role at GIA Miami, he spent almost a decade as the scientific director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the National Institutes of Health. From 1999 to 2010, he held the position of professor in residence in the Department of Neurology at the University of California, San Francisco, and served as the Howard Weinsberg Endowed Chair in Addiction Research. During this time, he also served as the Associate Director for Extramural Affairs at the Ernest Gallo Clinic and Research Center. Recently, Dr. Bonsi and his global collaborators have made significant advancements in translating non-invasive brain stimulation techniques like transcranial magnetic stimulation from preclinical studies to clinical applications, particularly in the treatment of cocaine use disorders and other forms of addiction. We certainly welcome my colleague and friend, Dr. Bonsi, today. Uh, it is great to hear your voice and it's great to see everybody. Hello from Italy. I just had a typical Saturday for me. I was practicing with my patients and then I came home and now I'm really glad to be with you guys. I'm gonna share my screen. Let me see. Da -da -da. And uh, let me see if we can. Yes. Can you guys see the the whole screen right now? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Yes, we do. Wonderful. That's great. So um, the most important slide is this one because we're gonna, I will try everyone to summarize 38 years of the basic knowledge about transcranial magnetic stimulation. Of course, there is a lot more to say. So everyone is welcome to uh, email me to contact me and uh, if you have any questions or if something is not clear that we don't get to cover today please do not hesitate to contact me and I will share articles with you my experience anything you need to do I have no intellectual property on TMS I just want everybody to know what TMS can do for our patients so please don't be shy and contact me at, at any time um let me see, let me go next. Okay, yes, disclosures, they are important. I'm not affiliated with any TMS company. I have, I decided, we decided from the very beginning in our clinical trials to not file for any intellectual properties. As I mentioned before, I'm a co-owner of these few clinics. Three are in Italy, three in the United States, four actually in the United States, and we're about to open a few more on the West Coast. And this is a scientific presentation, as you all know. So if you need me as a physician, you need to come to Italy. <laughs> I don't practice in the US. Um, I, I just want to start reminding ourselves that everything started 2,500 years ago with uh, our father, with Hippocrates. And uh, I still love this quote, because if you believe me, this is the only reason why usually some of our patients do not improve because they sometimes are not willing to give up what makes them sick. So this is a very important beginning of many conversations when I actually speak with our patients and try to understand what is their real motivation when they come to us. Do they really want to get better? Some, most of the times it's yes, but sometimes it's, the answer is less clear. Uh, we all know what we went through we call it and how our quality of life was affected so i don't need for this crowd to preach about this but there are many faces as you all know to quality of life right personal health relationship educational status work environment you know all of this and uh, you also know how two three four five six seven and eight affect number one which is what we're mostly talking about especially the physical and mental health um, we know how even one piece of our very delicate brain, when it goes wrong, how 
everything else can, can fall apart. And COVID, in a sense, the, this is the most complicated watch, by the way, ever produced in history. This is from Vacheron Constantin. It's called 7256, something like that. And even when one thing goes a little bit off by a little bit of percentage points, we have seen this with COVID, that people were kind of holding it together, many people with anxiety, depression, lots of diseases. And because of COVID, they just went a little bit off. And, and we all know the consequences in terms of epidemiology and statistics on what happens to people with neurological and psychiatric diseases. Um, the main symptoms of COVID affected um, the central nervous system in a very significant way. This is the short list. And uh, just as a reminder, decreased concentration of mental focus, difficulty maintaining attention, memory impairment, increased fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, anhedonia, low motivation, increased stress, agitation, addictions. This happened in two ways with COVID. It happened because of some people were affected by the virus itself, but also it happened because of the environmental isolation, for example, which wasn't a direct infection from COVID, but had really tremendous consequences on mental health nationwide, in the United States, but in Europe as well. You all know, probably, I'm pretty sure, what are the main effects of COVID-19 in our brain, basically the autoimmune response, the increase in inflammatory molecules, for example, cytokines, damaging brain blood vessels. And uh, recent reports have also shown that actually, and at, and at pathological reports show that COVID actually entered a certain patient's brain even without apparently in the presence of symptoms. So in asymptomatic patients. So this virus is still kind of a mystery from many points of view. But this study that I'm quoting from Paul Harrison and colleagues in the UK, showed that in patients that contracted COVID, about 236 and change, thousand, about 33.6% had long-term consequences, basically longer than six months, ranging from anxiety, depression, to increase in Parkinson's disease, uh, addictions, early stage dementia, and so on. So this is still a long wave that we are being affected by. And in the United States, we know that only about 50% of us seek help when, when we have a mental health problem. We don't always realize that, actually, but it's a, it's a major problem. And we're talking about, in general, 60 million people in the United States. One in five experience a mental illness each year, and one in 20 a serious mental illness each year. And the reasons why people do not reach out to us are diverse. Cost, almost 40% of us, thinking that they don't need us as physicians. That's another 26%, which is, which is very peculiar if you think about it, because if I need a cardiologist, if I'm a patient, I don't hesitate to go. But when it comes to brain diseases, neurology and psychiatry, I think we are probably the top specialty where people think that they don't need us, which is, I mean, surreal from certain points of view, as all of you know. 24% of people don't seem to know where to go for services. 20% think that they don't have time, and 10% say that this treatment wouldn't help. Now, the last point is very important. Treatment wouldn't help, but the majority of Americans do not know what treatments are available when it comes to neurology and psychiatry. So uh, it's, it's, sad. it's sad to see these numbers and these statistics, in my opinion. And despite the fact that we as clinicians and scientists try to do our best to inform people, I mean, we are bombarded with social media by random information that has no vetting, if you allow me, no quality control. And, and so people don't know. They don't even know what really the real medicine-based, science-based options are in many cases, which is, which is kind of sad. Um, as for my research, we're getting into that now. I started as a visiting assistant professor at UCSF many years ago. Actually, I did a 
postdoctoral fellowship first at the Volume Institute with John Williams studying cocaine and heroin and long-term consequences from a synaptic physiology point of view. Then when I moved to UCSF, as Marty said, I became eventually professor there and I ran my laboratory for 12 years, studying the long-term effects again of cocaine, alcohol and stress mainly on uh, the dopamine system initially. And I was also working at the Ernest Gallo Clinical Research Center at UCSF. And when I moved at DNAH, I continued this line of research as a neurophysiologist. I was obsessed by trying to figure out, first of all, the basic mechanisms underlying cocaine, alcohol abuse, and pathological stress. But as a physician, I was really trying to find anything that would bring back to patients some treatments through our research. So this is the story, basically short story. I will keep the science fairly quick about how one of my articles, an article from my group actually turned into creating the rationale to use transcranial magnetic stimulation in patients with addictions. Um, cocaine has never gone away as many of you know. It still remains the second most abused drug in the planet and uh, it's on the rise again. So tens of millions of people are actually abusing and using cocaine every year. From a medical point of view, many of you know that there's no pharmacological agents that directly can help with cocaine addiction. So it's kind of a, if, if you allow me, it's kind of an orphan disease in the sense that it doesn't have from the medical perspective, a therapeutic treatment. And that is why I was, interested in cocaine. Also because I love dopamine as a, as a physician. I treat lots of patients here in Italy with Parkinson's disease. I've always been using dopamine as the way to stay right in between neurology and psychiatry somehow, to be able to study and learn from both. So, and uh, another small detail, which also has to do with TMS, is that uh, also women, do use cocaine, but in certain counties in the United States, up to 30% of women do abuse alcohol, ecstasy, cocaine, heroin, marijuana, and prescription drugs, which is just really scary. And as you know, during pregnancy, it's not a great idea to take medications in general, but uh, there are studies done with TMS since 2014 showing that TMS can be administered during pregnancy to women, whether it's for anxiety or depression or addictions. So TMS is an option actually that can be done. Uh, the way that we reached the, uh, the data, we created the data to get back to patients and create this rationale to use TMS started from human studies, from functional imaging studies. And these functional imaging studies done by, by my old boss, the incredible Nora Volko, Elliot Stein, Linda Porino, and many other, Rita Goldstein, many other colleagues, show that in the frontal cortex, in patients with cocaine addiction, the activity measured with functional imaging of the frontal cortex was reduced compared to controls. So we had this evidence in people that somehow the frontal cortex which as you know, is the site for decision-making, the activity was reduced by chronic cocaine. So the idea that one of my brilliant postdocs, Billy Chen had was, okay, let's try now to see whether in a rodent animal, in rats, if we self-administer cocaine, if we let them to for a few months, can we measure somehow a similar reduction in brain activity? And if we can, can we reverse that activity, that reduction in activity, and see whether that has an effect on cocaine and on cocaine self-administration. And uh, the reversal of this reduction of activity by cocaine was actually produced in the study that I'm about to show you, thanks to this incredible technology that, that was invented back in 20, 2004, by Carl Dyson, uh, Ed Boyd, and who's at MIT now, Ernest Bamberg, and Feng Zhang. And this is a, I'm sure that many of you know what optogenetics is, but 
optogenetics is an incredible technology that allows you be a specific promoter and be a, a benign virus to selectively target brain regions or subtypes of cells inside brain regions, for example, the dopamine subtype, the serotonin subtype, the GABAergic subtype. And uh, through these chain neurodopsins, which are ion channels that can be inserted, light sensitive ion channels, once the virus infects via promoter, let's say the dopamine neurons, then with this certain frequency of light through optogenetics, we can turn on millisecond by millisecond or turn off millisecond by millisecond entire clusters of brain cells. And this is important because we use this technology after we exposed these threads to cocaine for a couple of months to return on selectively the big pyramidal neurons of the frontal cortex. So this technology allowed us to achieve what, what we wanted to first measure changes in the frontal cortex and then try to reverse the changes that cocaine produced. So thanks to optogenetics that uh, actually this has been the largest revolution in neuroscience, as many say in the last century. So phenomenal technology. And the model that we used is um, a self-administration model. Rats were given cocaine for a couple of months, just seek, take that, press two levers in order to get cocaine. And at the end of these two months of cocaine self-administration, they received four sessions where there was a foot shock as, if you will, the negative consequence of taking cocaine and uh, via these four sessions of foot shock, what we observed was that these are the pinkish four sessions where rats who had already been self administered cocaine for a couple of months now received access to cocaine, but also these mild foot shocks. 70% of them, the shock sensitive guys, quit self administering for cocaine. Somehow, this negative consequence was telling them, okay, I like cocaine, but not enough to be shocked for this thing. So 70% of them quit self-administering cocaine, but the remaining 30% of them, the shock resistance, or as Barry Evans, my friend says, the compulsive cocaine seekers, they would keep on self-administering cocaine after the initial two months of self-administration, despite this negative consequence. And these were, the target of our study. So what uh, Billy Chen and the rest of my group did was now to go in this prelimbic region of rats, which is the most crucial part of the frontal cortex of rats and see whether this long exposure to cocaine had reduced brain activity in the frontal cortex. So the prelimbic region is what we chose from the entire frontal cortex of rats because it's heavily connected with infralimbic, with the entire limbic system, with our entire emotional system. So this is why we decided to do electrophysiological recordings in the prelimbic cortex. And what Billy observed, you can see this electrophysiological records is the shock resistant guys or the compulsive cocaine seekers had a very significant reduction in action potentials, basically compared to naive controls, but also compared to the shock sensitive guys, which also had a reduction, pretty important, in brain activity in terms of action potentials. Now, and that's basically the, the summary from an electrophysiological perspective of how many action potentials per stimulation we, we saw. But now, what we can do in these friends, as they were all uh, pre-exposed to this viral injection that allowed us to remote control brain activity of the frontal cortex, Billy was able now in rats that have been self administering cocaine in a compulsive way to stimulate the frontal cortex through optogenetics and restart, basically turn very quiet brain activity in these compulsive cocaine seekers to an increase in action potentials with the idea that if a reduction of action potentials in the frontal cortex is related to decreased 
uh, to an increased cocaine self-administration. Now, if we return on the frontal cortex, we should see a reduction of cocaine self-administration. So that was the theory and the idea behind the experiment that uh, Billy did. So this was the central hypothesis. If hypoactivity of the prelimbic cortex is causally related, not just a correlation with cocaine seeking, then optogenetic activation of the prelimbic area That's with optogenetics should reduce cocaine seeking. And uh, this is what we did, basically. We uh, returned on this frontal cortex by using optogenetics with this uh, light frequency throughout the entire sick period. And uh, this slide, I'm summarizing you guys this, this nature paper to, to get to the point of this conversation. If you look at the last column of each graph to your right, channel rhodopsin plus shock, these are the compulsive cocaine speakers, you see an increased latency of these reds to press for cocaine. So the interpress interval, the green column as well goes up, but most importantly, the blue column, the light blue column, when we return on different cortex of these reds, the number of lever presses in the compulsive cocaine seekers goes from like seven to basically to a massive reduction within a few minutes as we return on their frontal cortex. So this created enough uh, scientific rationale for us to be able to go to an IRB and basically tell them, look, the idea now is to be able to stimulate the frontal cortex of people by using a technology. And I, I just want to pause a second on why we ended up choosing TMS as opposed to other approaches. We, we didn't even try to develop medications. Uh, we didn't, we knew that there weren't any off the shelf medications that could increase frontal cortex activity. And all of you know that it takes between 12 and 15 years to develop a new medication from scratch. And the cost of that is way above $10 billion, assuming that everything goes well. So developing medications, even if I was a DNAH, wasn't a viable option. The second theoretical possibility is to use deep brain stimulation, which as you know, has been used for Parkinson's disease, for OCD, but deep brain stimulation is an invasive technology. You need a neurosurgeon. I don't think many people would be happy to go through a surgery in order to reduce their cocaine intake. So no, it's a very precise, wonderful technology, but not exactly practical. And then we had transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is non-invasive, minimal side effects in general. And uh, that is why we decided to uh, apply for a clinical trial for a pilot study with the IRB to suggest to use transcranial magnetic stimulation in patients with severe cocaine addiction. The history, now I'm taking a pause for a second. M many of you, I, I love history, but many of you may not know that the very first time that electrical stimulation was thought as a therapy in medicine was already 2,500 years ago because Hippocrates somehow had this idea down south from here a little bit in Greece to, to use this small electric fish, the lamprey, to help people with migraine, with head pain. Somehow he figured out that by placing this tiny electric fish into the forehead of patients, similarly to what we do with TMS in the frontal cortex, was uh, creating some relief from pain in patients with migraines, which is incredible to me how we could remotely think about using electricity in people to help them with something. It's just 2,500 years ago. It's mind blowing. But then the, the Romans, like we copied almost everything from the Greeks, of course, we also copied this idea of using electric fish. This is the uh, doctor of the Emperor Claudius, Scribonius Largus, who recycled the same idea of using this electric fish to help people with head pain somehow. And then the more scientific 
concept of using electricity and thinking a body as an electric body started in the Renaissance with Luigi Galvani here in Italy. And the most important experiment when it comes to TMS was actually done, this, this was very fortuitous actually, uh, Hans Christian Horset about 200 years ago was in a class teaching his students and by chance he placed this tiny battery here next to his compass. It wasn't planned. And as he turned on the battery, the compass turned immediately perpendicular to the electric field. This is where for the first time, we as people began to understand that electric and magnetic are always joined and connected. And then Faraday, through the Faraday's law, defined the basic rules of electromagnetism. And this is Dr. Anthony Barker that in 1985 actually created the Sheffield magnet, which is the first prototype of transcranial magnetic stimulation. Something very important, we kind of knew already in the 80s that electrical stimulation was helping patients. Beside electroshock, which has been around now for more than 100 years, but um, we already knew that electrical stimulation could have been used, even in patients with depression. But the idea of Anthony was that magnetism allowed him as a physicist, as a physicist, to create a more focused electric field because he wanted to stimulate selectively in the frontal cortex in patients with, with depression. These were clinicians asking him to help patients with depression because back in the mid 80s, we kind of knew that medications can help in about 35 to 40% of patients in a very significant way, but the remaining 50 plus percent of patients do not uh, improve significantly with the antidepressants, with the medication that we use. So he was pulled in by clinicians like us to create something else. And again, this focused electrical electromagnetic stimulation was created in 1985. Since 1985, there are more now actually than 20,000 articles, last time I checked, on transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's non-invasive, as you know, the feeling in the forehead is like a AAA battery, so it's not painful, it's not a shock. It's that they approve for depression, anxious depression, OCD, smoking cessation. And uh, thanks to our studies, I'm very proud to say, at least in Europe, the EMA gave the CE approval since 2021 for TMS to be used in substance use disorders as well. Right now, more than 12 million people have already used worldwide TMS. So it is, it's not a secret, but it's one of the best kept secrets from the main public in general for what TMS can do. And I just I like to remind always that TMS is not electroshock and it's very different than electroshock. As for the main effects of TMS, there are many studies on that. I try to summarize what's relevant for you. The four main effects of TMS are the chemical and metabolic, basically release of dopamine, serotonin, GABA, you name it. There is a vascular effect of TMS, uh, increased in brain blood flow and oxygenation. TMS produces brain plasticity, new brain connections. And uh, TMS has an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, studies have shown that it reduces certain subtypes of interleukins and reduces production of caspase one, for example. So it's, I'm sure that with time, we'll find out more about other effects of TMS, but these four effects are probably the reason why when medications, for example, for depression or anxiety or OCD do not work, TMS does, because the mechanism of action is very different from traditional medications. And also TMS from an a uh, physiological point of view on what it can do to our brain comes into different flavors. One flavor is to stimulate, to increase brain activity, certain brain regions. If you use frequencies like 10 or 15 Hertz, for example, or TMS can reduce brain activity. Reduce brain activity if you use low frequencies, such as one Hertz, because low, low frequencies such as one Hertz, for example, we as 
synaptic physiologists have seen for decades now that it produces a phenomenon on excitatory receptors called long-term depression, basically a reduction of excitatory activity. So in fact, TMS is used at low frequencies, for example, when people struggle with anxiety or ADD or OCD or insomnia, because QEG as well has shown that certain brain regions are faster in terms of activity than controlled. So the one earth frequency in those conditions slows down excessive brain activity. While when it comes to depression or addictions, we use higher frequencies of stimulation to basically stimulate and wake up, in this case, the dorsal atrial prefrontal cortex. This is also another very important concept to remember when it comes to TMS. TMS, even when we stimulate in the frontal cortex, doesn't produce simply a focalized effect. TMS produces a network effect. These are fMRI studies by Michael Fox and Alvaro Pascal Leone at Harvard. And as you can see in the red regions, this is where different groups prefer to consider the center of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And when they stimulate in these red areas, as you can see to your right on the screen, the yellow and orange, we basically turn on an entire network. The frontal regions are all turned on in terms of fMRI, medial portions of our brain as well. So this is really a network effect. It's not a specific effect just in the place of stimulation like the prefrontal cortex. And the pilot study that we did was actually a study, as I mentioned earlier, on pretty severe cocaine uh, cases, 16.8 years of cocaine use, uh, using cocaine 4.8 times per week. So, I mean, this is 4.8 days per week. So pretty severe, severe cases. And in the control group, they were a little bit lighter, like 13 years of cocaine use, 4.3. And uh, these patients did in the pilot study four weeks of TMS initially, uh, 16 patients on one arm, 16 patients on the other arm, and the TMS group, basically 69%, 70% of them after doing TMS had urine drug test negative for cocaine. In the control group that received the usual medications to support, only three patients out of 15 after those four weeks had urine drug test negative. Then we recycled 10 patients from the non-TMS arm into the TMS and the same story happened as in the TMS group. Seven out of 10 patients urine drug test negative at the end of those, actually at the end of 90 days. So pilot study, very small, again, not a double blind, but it made us you know, pretty optimistic that it was worth keeping on working on, on this idea of TMS. Uh, this was started seven, eight years ago at this point, so we know a lot. Uh, some collaborators and friends also did a double blind that confirmed what we observed in the pilot study. So the evidence is there. This is not just a placebo effect with TMS, but, and it's a long lasting effect. Now, our first patients were treated back in 2015, 2016. So, and we are still in touch with quite a few of them. So there is evidence at this point that TMS is, is working. And as for us, as for our group, um, we decided to keep on treating everyone as opposed to uh, splitting patients into TMS and non-TMS. And um, and the data that I want to show you next is from almost a thousand patients that, that we summarized and that we studied over an actual time of two years. Uh, you also know another thing that I, I want to just share for a second, that clinical trials are sometimes very different from our clinical practice. For example, in our clinical practice, and we have learned that we always offer therapeutic supports whenever patients need that. We, we really nurture the patient, the families, the caregivers. So in a sense, it's always much more than just TMS. The patients are surrounded with other services, with other uh, healthcare professionals. So 
that is the approach that you can use in the clinical practice. And uh, in the clinical trials, because of science has to be done, of course, in the most rigorous way, we tend to be obviously more aseptic. We have to have a lot of exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria, but the experience of the patients is, is not the same as in a, you know, in a very nurturing clinical setting. So we chose to go for the full uh, experience for the patients, which, which could be also why uh, the outcome that we observe is higher than, than what you would observe probably in a perfect clinical trial where the patient goes in, does TMS, goes out, but is not really uh, like uh, followed in the most comprehensive way. And we need both. We need 1,000% rigorous clinical trials, but we also need, I think, to not discard the, the data and what we observe from our daily clinical practice, even if it's not as scientifically useful as a typical rigorous clinical trial. And uh, what we observed from those 985 patients treated with TMS and tried to follow for two years was that uh, these patients, 50% of them in the beige uh, dots, 50% of the TMS treated patients relapsed after 91 days. This other group, the light blue group, is a group from Yale University that we used to compare. This was treatment as usual, basically not TMS. A beautiful uh, piece of data by, by Virginia Senior, who's a professor there. And patients without TMS, I know this is a very kind of uh, difficult comparison. We are comparing apples with oranges. Patients in Yale with no TMS at Yale, Connecticut versus patients that did TMS. But it's just to give you a ballpark idea on what usually happens without TMS. And in the non-TMS patients, Rajita showed that after 51 days, 50% of the patients do relapse. So this already was a very encouraging piece of data. But, and, and also this shows, this is a selection of 148 patients with the yellow dots when they relapsed to cocaine use. If you remember, these were patients ballpark using cocaine four to five times per week. As you can see here, the line zero is after the end of those four weeks. These patients, do relapse, some of them, and uh, they also come back, the light blue dots, for additional TMS sessions. So this is, if they were keeping on using it as before TMS, basically what you would see in this graph would be a notion of yellow. And so on. And the most important average data is that patients after TMS sessions um, averaged relapses less than once every two months. So this is pretty remarkable data compared to patients that used cocaine almost on a daily basis. And this is the study that we published in 2020 that basically convinced, convinced the EMA to, to approve, uh, to give the C approval in Europe for TMS for cocaine addiction. Now, what do these patients, now many years have passed, we are more than 5,000 treated, what do these patients say after they do TMS, even if they used alcohol or cocaine or they gamble for quite a few years? I have to add that none of these patients had a single diagnosis, not one of them. Whether it was depression, anxiety, alcohol abuse plus cocaine, benzodiazepines plus cocaine and so on, we saw really everything and we embraced whatever co-diagnosis we noticed and we just treated everyone. So this is a very short collection of very common sentences that I would say most of the patients do share with us. First of all, I don't think about it anymore. Whether it's alcohol, cocaine, gambling, I just don't think about it anymore after stimulating this frontal cortex. Why was I doing it? Seems so stupid now and that I did. This is more 
we believe with the awakening, really stimulating the prefrontal cortex and re-giving a person proper decision-making, right? This is what the frontal cortex does. I don't dream about, this is about cocaine, I don't dream about it anymore. Uh, and this is also very interesting. I see friends drinking or doing it in front of me, but it doesn't touch me anymore. So the stimuli, if I'm driving my car and I see a bar or I see a, a billboard of a slot machine or a mountain of snow, those stimuli don't produce cue-induced reactivity. I remain fairly neutral, just it doesn't touch me anymore, which is very, very important. And the last one is I don't remember the pleasure. This is particularly for cocaine. Many patients say all of a sudden, and just I forgot why and what was the pleasure of using cocaine. Now, there is uh, also a different group of people that, that we have been seeing recently, people that do not come for an addiction, people that come only for anxiety, performance anxiety sometimes, or depression. And, uh, and, they, and this, this area of TMS is actually expanding, the performance side of TMS. But, but these people like uh, singers or athletes, they say, for example, I'm now singing like I never had before. I'm not afraid of going on stage anymore. I run faster longer, I couldn't create new songs for almost two years, and then I did TMS to be able to be more creative, or, or when it comes to the decision-making side of TMS, now I'm an executive, I do TMS before my advisory board to try to make better decisions for my company. So the indications of TMS, and this is another very important piece of information, have expanded a lot since 1985. If you take a look at those 20,000 studies, TMS and Alzheimer's, TMS and suicidality reduction. This is a beautiful study at Brown University. Um, TMS and trauma, PTSD, TBI, elderly people, adolescents. TMS is expanding. TMS and the indications for TMS have been expanding now for a very long time, right between neurology, again, and psychiatry in both domains. We have also a lot of patients here in Italy with Parkinson's disease, with early stage dementia. The data is fairly strong that it doesn't cure dementia, of course, but it slows down progression in many cases. And I, I just so actually study, this is very preliminary at a meeting that we had in Milan where TMS has been applied to ALS, as well, again, to try to reduce probably through the anti-inflammatory effect. So a lot of new potential indications for TMS beyond addiction, beyond depression and anxiety. So in, um, in conclusion, uh, we started from a very simple study in rats back in 2013, done with optogenetics. And, uh, and we kind of jumped with the leap of faith toward transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, I should also mention that the protocols are fairly short. They only last a few minutes, so they're not like a nuisance for patients. Um, TMS so far has been giving, in our hands, incredible results. We, we have patients telling us, and we test them, of course, uh, every four weeks and so on before and after TMS, 90% of our patients, 9-0, whether it's anxiety or depression or addictions or OCD, report significant improvements. Uh, TMS, once again, is never performed in our clinics in isolation because we don't believe it would work if a patient has addiction of any type and we just try to wake up the frontal cortex, sure, Cravings could be gone, but the patient would go back to another addiction probably fairly quickly. So it would be a waste of time, money, everything for the patient. So we always try to really bring together psychology, medicine, medication management, always, and TMS to all of our patients. But TMS has been really uh, incredible in what we have seen and how many people have, have improved when you do it properly, which is bringing me to the last point. 
uh, TMS says if you read articles, the statistics in terms of percentage of success with TMS, they can vary between 50, 60%, and let's say Stanford, 92%, right? Which is the key weakness and feature of TMS. TMS is very heavily dependent on the operator. It depends on who does it. It depends on the combination of TMS protocols. It depends on the experience of the center. And uh, it depends on other features as well. Certain TMS machines do need navigation systems. Studies have been shown very recently that if you don't have a navigation system with certain TMS, the chances of being on target is about 48% meaning that 52% of the time you would be off target and not where you're supposed to be, which decreases, of course, success rate. So TMS is, is not unfortunately like medications where 20 milligrams or 20 milligrams. And I can take them, you can take them, and it's the same. TMS is heavily dependent on the center and the location. So this is probably why people have mixed opinions sometimes about TMS. Yeah, I've heard about it, but I'm not sure it works. And uh, so if any of you is interested in learning more about TMS and seeing our TMS centers, as you know, we have one fairly close to you down in Miami. I'm going to be back to Miami on January 10th. And uh, of course, you're all invited to visit us. And until then, of course, you're all invited to ask me any questions you like about TMS. In summary and conclusion, our study was the first study, sh study showing a scientific rationale for using TMS, the nature paper, uh, to treat symptoms of cocaine use disorders. Many studies now for decades have shown that TMS offers higher success rate than many medications as well as in conditions where there is no medication available. For example, cocaine and fetamine addiction, pathological gambling. TMS, as I said before, is not a substitution to therapies or other forms of therapies, but should be offered in a synergistic manner. Therapy and medicine, CBT, DBT, EMDR, you name it, are always necessary and essential in synergy with TMS. And the number of TMS protocols is expanding. There are hundreds of them at this point. And uses of TMS are expanding constantly. And TMS at present, hopefully not for long, is one of the most promising emerging treatments for substance use disorders and a variety of other neurological and psychiatric conditions. So I, this is the end of the conversation. I had a lot of collaborators and I still do have them now, but for the initial nature paper, Billy Chen for leading the study and Carl Dyson of Tom Stanford for providing us with optogenetics. And this is the team that did the clinical trials and that is still collecting data as we speak. So now you are all more than welcome to ask me any questions if you have questions. I, I have an honor to say that you are not only friend of Dr. Eccles, uh, you are also friend of Larkin Hospital and basically is my best friend because I have seen you actions, doing the work, incredible. I have a, uh, one question. A typically, a Alzheimer's dementia patient was seen in my practice many times and I was not... Mm -hmm. Uh, having any problem. But recently I am seeing some type of atypical presentation. Okay. This is actually, uh, we are seeing more that the patients sometimes not only forgetting the retro uh, effect of their memories, they are actually presently hanging towards their own ability to drive and then they get disappeared. So I know that TMS has a role in midbrain and yes. cortical level. Yes. So my question is, is there any role that you have uh, seen that can play 
in a very atypical type of individuals where we don't have no treatment really, you understand? So we can provide TMS as a, a research maybe, or somehow we can bring those patients into um, your uh, TMS uh, facilities. So that that is a great question. In terms of the, the dementias, whether it's vascular dementia, for example, atypical dementias like, like Lewis body pick or uh, FTD, Alzheimer's, we don't know if it's the anti-inflammatory effect of TMS. We don't know if it's the effect on depression, anxiety, on a kind of social interactions that do improve quality of life. We don't know if it's the brain plasticity or the chemical effect, release of dopamine, as you mentioned, release of other neurotransmitters. But the mix of these things can improve if the dementia is in the early stages, any of them. Now, why? Why we don't know. We don't know because when it comes to humans, as you well know, we can only do a couple of things. We can do quantitative EEG, we can do functional imaging, but, but when it comes to, to the dementia, the first studies were started basically in 2011 at CAMH, at the University of, of Toronto, this beautiful place, but, but still we are so limited when it comes to people on why and how it happens that, you know, we we would do it whenever there is rationale to say, okay, this patient has, you know, memory loss, these this behavioral changes, depressed, anxious, family cannot communicate with them. That is usually enough. But why and how to target or select TMS in forms of dementia, we still do not do not know enough about it. It doesn't hurt. We have also seen but just said there are cases where family said, you know, I just want to try TMS. I really want to try because the alternative is nothing. And with some improvements, especially in the social interaction with the other family members, communicating, recognizing cases. But, but beyond that, we still don't, don't know enough, unfortunately. Dr. Mosi, I have a question. How do you deal with insurance yes. reimbursement? Is it covered by Medicare or by insurance or... or no, that's that's a sore note. Um, insurances, when it comes to depression, are getting a little bit better. They used to want, believe it or not, Jack, they wanted patients to try four different medications at maximum doses, which is, okay, it's insane. Now they're down to two. So it, it can be done now easier for depression. Uh, they used to not want any co-diagnosis, which is also bizarre because many patients have more than one diagnosis. So in a nutshell, insurances are getting a little bit more lenient now, more collaborative, but not beyond the domain of depression in general, which is really, really sad to me because it's costing society way more than approving TMS for anxiety, for depression, for OCD, for many, many different things. So yeah, it's really sad. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Hi, Doctor. This is Dr. Ferrer. Uh, thank you so I... much for such a lovely presentation. Thank uh, you. First of all, I mean, I would love when you're in Miami uh, to expose our residents uh, to go and, and see what you're doing the work you're doing, especially with the cocaine use disorder. Um, yes. And, Absolutely. Uh, and have our pa our patients also benefit, uh, you know, from your work. Um, one thing that you said uh, that, it, it, you know, it requires the right individual with the right training to be able to do this. Uh, because I've noticed, for example, some patients that I have with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, mixed results. Like I've seen some patients that I, you know, have had sessions, have gone back and had, you know, even more sessions that they have provided them for free, and have ended up, you know, coming back and even after giving them ample time uh, for the procedure to actually do its neuroplasticity to work, I, 
I've noticed that I've had to go back and put them in hardcore medications for, for the disorder. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit, you know, those mixed uh, uh, results? Is it just uh, from uh, the experience that the individual has uh, doing the procedure? Um, mm-hmm. Or it can be just uh, a poor response on some of the patients? It's, it's probably a mix of both. So when it comes to OCD, first of all, unlike uh, anxiety, it, it's paradoxical, but, but we know in the medicine field, unlike anxiety, for example, insomnia or, or depression or even severe forms of cravings in addictions, OCD patients, we tell them up front, even when they finish, I didn't mention that, now the traditional 36 TMS sessions. So they, they basically do them for four weeks, five times a week, Monday to Friday. Then they finish the first four weeks, which is 20 sessions, five times a week. Then they move into maintenance, three times a week for two weeks, two times a week for two weeks. The OCD patients are usually the only ones where the majority of them, even if and when they feel significantly better. And we have a lot of cases that went amazing. They regain their life. They keep on coming. They keep on coming whether it's once a month whether it's whatever they can, but OCD, the circuitry, which is very similar if you think about it to, to medications. OCD patients very rarely can stop whatever medication they're taking. So our success rate with OCD, it's still above 80%. But um, wow. the outcome, 80%, it doesn't cure OCD. It keeps OCD under control to the point that the quality of life of the patient is very sustainable. We, we had people that couldn't function because of OCD. Now these people still have OCD, but they have a normal life. They can work, they can have social interactions, uh, a life with their partners. So it keeps it under control, but they tend to come back. They tend to choose how frequently, once every four weeks on average, it's, it's fairly typical. Um, when it comes to the success rate, there are four main companies and uh, some are better than others in terms of TMS machines. Uh, one, again, like we, we use McVenture and Greenswood, for example. We love both of them. One is deeper, different shape of coil. The other one is more superficial, but as a navigation system, I mean, in general, if people really know what they're doing, like I, I mentioned Stanford, but I could mention the Mayo Clinic or um, Harvard or UCLA, the vast, vast majority of patients do feel better. Actually, I, I was at dinner very recently with Andy Luchter, who runs the UCLA TMS clinic. It gave me goosebumps. We see exactly the same outcomes. Pa- patients with massive strokes, that speed up their rehab, for example. So unfortunately, it's an art. It's an art and is not you plug and play, you train a technician for, for a week and you see results. We train technicians for weeks. But if you were to buy a machine tomorrow from, from a company, within about 12 hours of training, when they do the training for you, a technician would get certified. So they could technically do TMS and they can just put the coordinates usually only for depression. That's what the majority of places do. They only treat depression. So it's the weakness of TMS. It's fairly easy to get up and running and the certification is fast, but (laughs) it took us years to develop proper protocols, but you don't have to. And that is the problem. That's the problem with TMS. Thank you so much. Uh, we are the signs of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But guys, we will follow up with, with Dr. Ahmed and with Dr. Eccles and, and we can organize mid to late January uh, a site, a, a visit. If you like, we can talk more about TMS. And if I can help you guys to train anybody, post your residents to, to show them a little bit more. Do, do remember, I'm not, I'm, I'm not being modest, but do remember that we are a clinic. We are not um, 
a university environment. So our patients are like the bread and butter daily, anxiety, depression, addictions, and so on. So it's not a university environment, but whatever I can teach to your students, 100% everything. Absolutely. Doctor, I had, a, I had a, a related question. Uh, have you um, researched the use of haifu? No. Because we have um, this, there's a potential for uh, use of haifu, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously less invasive than DBS, but um, mm -hmm. because you don't need to, you need you, you need to you don't need to enter the brain or anything like that. It it, it can be done. Uh, you can map it. That's that's very interesting. I, I would be more than happy to to speak about it more, Jack. When whenever whenever I'm back, yeah, I, we're, I getting the, more, we're getting I, the I equipment uh, mainly for treatment of like uh, other conditions. But um, okay. somebody mentioned that it could be kind of a kind of a more precise use for 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 addiction. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. it, it's going to require to be a trial and that type of stuff, but. Uh, when, when you come in, I'll have you talk to our neurosurgeon, Dr. Wolf. Absolutely, yes. I would love to. Again, guys, there, there, there's not enough anyway. So, and, and TMS is so expensive for now that whatever else we can do to move science forward, absolutely. I, I would love to speak with him. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. I have one, one more thing to ask is that we have a, a large population of uh, psychiatric patients in Larkin system. So if you get any opportunity that we can do some collaborative research work, um, I would be very much interested to plug it in with our IRB. So what, I, what I'm thinking, Dr. Ahmed, is that what we should do for Larkin, which is needed for Larkin and for the patients, is if we can create a team of interested researchers and physicians who want to apply for NIH money to do clinical trials at Larkin. Now, that would be fantastic as far as I'm concerned, because we are, as, 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 you, as you know, my, my clinic is this tiny high-end boutique thing, but anything I can do to help to put together grants and apply for funding so that we have clinical trials done at Larkin with TMS, Absolutely, I would love to help in any way. There is a tremendous need anyway. So that, that, that would be wonderful. Why not? I mean, there's not enough. Like, like the, the, the TMS uh, scientific environment is, is not saturated by too many people. There's not enough of it. And I, I basically do all the research by analyzing the data in our clinic. So I don't do the real research that like universities do. It's just observational. So. This would be wonderful if anybody would be interested, even from residents to other physicians to say, let's try to think if we can come up with grant applications. Absolutely, we, we should have a day where I come over and we talk. That is the part. Thank you, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, doctor, and thank you guys to, for, for inviting me. So we will follow up. Jack, we'll follow up, Sultan, we will... Uh, <laughs> Let's get Beautiful. the students there. Me too. Thank you again. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank, thank you so much. I so thank appreciate you, it. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. We look to forward you too, Marty, to you returning you. to the States. Me I do too. want to say thank you to all of our participants and our uh, people who joined us today. This has been a remarkable morning. And I want to share with my colleague, uh, Dr. Ahmed, who would like to extend greetings, I'm sure. Oh, thank you, everybody. Actually, no, no further extensions of the time because everybody enjoyed it today. It was a very successful CME meeting. Thank you, Dr. Jack Mitchell. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you guys, for inviting me. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.